this is going to be a little bit of a new experience for me, because I've talked about our project quite a bit. But uh, this is going to be the first time that I've ever been asked to talk about my own experience in this project. With that in mind, can I have the clicker, please? Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm Dr. Benjamin Lebrow, the founder of the Floating Doctors Medical Mission Team. We're a medical mission team using a 100-ton ship that we rebuilt from a derelict vessel to deliver health care and public health solutions to remote communities living without their basic human rights to health. In the last three years, we've delivered over 140,000 pounds of relief supplies to more than 56 communities in Haiti, Honduras, and Panama. Over 350 volunteers have treated over 15,000 patients. We've worked in remote mountain communities in Panama, in the slums of Cap Haitian during the cholera epidemic, along remote stretches of Haiti's north coast in Honduras, uh, and in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, which was our first mission. Today we're here to talk about living out loud, what that means and how to do it. And in this job, I feel like I'm constantly taught how, you know, I'm constantly taught what that means. And ironically, to find out how to live, first we need to look at how we die. I remember very clearly the first patient of mine that ever passed away despite doing everything that could be done, um, and every patient since. For the health worker, a patient's death is an extremely vulnerable moment. You simultaneously face your own mortality and also your ultimate powerlessness over events. I remember when a month-old baby passed away in Labadee in Haiti. She'd been losing weight every day of her life for a month. She was not bonded with the mom. And despite doing everything that could be done with what was available, she slipped away one night, never had a chance. And I remember feeling extraordinarily helpless and angry at myself and at the world. But I remembered something that my dad, who's a very fine physician, says about patients and their lives and deaths. Sometimes when people die, it's the anticipated passing at the end of a long, rich life. And sometimes it's that unexpected nightmare of a child mangled by a car accident and brought into your emergency room at 3 o'clock in the morning. But no matter what we do as doctors, ultimately, everyone gets the same. One lifetime. No more, no less. My dad always says that he never tells pe people that they're going to die. He reminds them. And every patient facing eternity highlights the importance of this moment, you know, right now in our lives. Because nowhere does it say for how long a life only that you get one, and one only. And in this job, we can, you know, I see often how suddenly and how senselessly it can be taken away. And every time that happens, it drives home how important each moment really is in our lives. One patient who really stays with me is a burn victim I treated uh, a few weeks into our first mission to Haiti. The last patient of the day is always the hardest. You're tired. It was the end of a brutal clinic, and this guy comes up and says, hey, can you help me? So we go into a private consulting room, he takes off his clothes, and he's got these horrible burns with bandages grown into the living, to, into the living flesh. You know, in anywhere else, he'd be an inpatient at a burn ward, he'd be getting skin grafts, he'd be getting morphine, except he lives in Haiti. So I gave antibiotics, I gave as much pain medication as we had, and I cleaned up the mess as best I could. And amazingly, he was actually starting to heal. He disappeared as quickly as he came. But that day, he made a huge leap of faith in putting himself in my hands to try and help. This stranger who shows up you know, out of the sea, you know, out of nowhere, and sets up a clinic on the beach. You know, that leap of faith was a decision to live out loud and not give up, even though he was terrified. Just like so many of our patients, the first time they come from far to see us or when they hand their children over to us to take care of. That gigantic leap of trust is a huge leap of faith. And I had a moment of clarity while I was scraping dead tissue off of that guy's calves. I suddenly realized where I was and what I was doing and how incredibly surreal it was. I suddenly realized that my dream of creating this mobile medical mission and actually doing it had actually happened. You know, it took everything that I had you know, and that other people had to make this project. I was all in financially, emotionally, even physically. If, it ha if the project didn't work, I was going to be left with nothing but a mountain of ruined dreams and debt. And when I made my leap of faith to do this, there was no safety net. But you can't win if you don't play. Now, why do we say a leap of faith? 
because leap indicates the possibility of falling, and falling hurts. Our heads know that we might fall, just as our heads know we might succeed. And that fear of falling, the fear of failing in that leap, this is what keeps us back from the ledge, and keeps us from realizing our dreams on the other side. If our heads had their way, we would never fall, and we'd never be hurt. We'd never start a new enterprise, never trust a new doctor, never fall in love. We'd be safe, and while we huddled in our beds, life would pass by outside. Every step that we take, literally, is made out of belief that we will land safely. Every decision that we make is based in the belief that it will come out how we hope. But it doesn't, does it? Sometimes your, your new enterprise goes bankrupt. Sometimes your new doctor's treatment fails. And sometimes your heart gets broken. We fall, and it hurts. And this is what it means to me to live out loud, to live knowing I sometimes will fall and still taking those leaps of faith. I know that if I don't doubt myself or hesitate, I might make it across. But if I do hesitate, I will definitely fall. Those leaps over the great chasms that separate us from our dreams are not made from the head. They're made from the heart. You will never make it if you step hesitantly forward. You've got to drop your baggage, take a good long running leap, and hurl yourself screaming out over the abyss, arms flailing, every cell in your being willing you across. You know, just like that burn patient who came across the threshold of our clinic or my volunteers who pick up the medical bag and follow me off into the jungle. Still, what if we don't make it? What about if I fall? Well, sometimes we do fall. Sometimes it turns out to have been a terrible mistake to make the leap. But it is always a mistake never even to make the attempt. Sometimes we soar over the abyss, landing safely on the other side, and sometimes we take a leap with all the heart in the world and we fall to our doom. But there is a third option. Sometimes when we fall, we find out we can fly. And if we can't fly, then you damn well build your wings on the way down. <laughs> and occasionally, even when you can't build your wings in time, when the ground is coming up fast, right before you smack the ground, that's when angels appear. I remember one instance that I will never, ever forget. The night before we sailed for Haiti for the first time, after a year of rebuilding our boat, it had just been put back in the water by the boatyard, packed with medical supplies, packed with volunteers. It's 11 o'clock at night. I'm sitting on the boat, freaking out. We've got no money. There's nothing. And we owe the boatyard $1,100 in order to be able to depart. The next day, if we can't come up with it, we accrue a whole other month's charges. So I'm sitting here under enormous pressure going, God, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna get out of this? And up the dock, out of the darkness, this real salty sailor uh, who we had met a couple of days before, whose ship had come in and we'd chatted to casually, walks up and hands me two cases of Red Bull and a wad of cash totaling $1,100. <laughs> and says, you know, uh, this you might need for your transit, it's 1,000 miles, I was like, oh, thank you. And uh, this was all we could take out of the ATM uh, today, but, you know, we really, we hope this helps. And the next day, we paid our bill to the marina, and we sailed for Haiti on his wings. And in medicine, this applies as much as anywhere. And this is why I've always believed that the real reason the caduceus has a set of wings. For me, the wings remind me that the result of every decision I make for a patient's health is in the future, which no one knows. And I ultimately have no control over the result at all, no matter how much I wish it were otherwise. All I have control over is how I choose to face this moment, right now. And when I look at this symbol, I remember, either to, I remember to always be ready to build wings and learn to fly if that's what it takes. Living out loud means making each of these moments count. Never shrinking from the unknown future, that's about 10 seconds. Never shrinking from the unknown future or putting off tomor till tomorrow the kindness we could do today. Before I came to do, flo to do floating doctors, I worked in geriatrics in Ireland and I had 35 elderly bedridden hospice patients, and every single one, when I said I wanted to do this project and create it, said the same thing. Do it now. Don't wait. Do it now. And I listened, because there was about 2,500 years of experience talking to me. <laughs> and yeah, what was I going to say? Oh, no, I, I know better than you. And after five years and more hard work than anyone will ever know, my life stream has been manifested before my eyes and continues to develop beyond what I ever imagined. I'm very blessed to lead a project that teaches me every single day how to continue living out loud. 
And to close, I'd like us to contemplate this ad, this apocryphal ad placed by polar explorer Ernest Shackleton 105 years ago. Men wanted for hazardous journey. Small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. <laughs> Thousands answered that ad 105 years ago, and 28 were chosen. I like to believe that if that ad ran again today, that thousands would still make the decision in that moment to make that leap of faith and to follow their dreams. And as it happens, all 28 men, oops, all 28 men who went came back alive and came back as heroes. Because sometimes it's the wildest leap is the one that lands safely. Thank you. <laughs>